Good evening. I didn't hear you. And what a privilege to be here this evening. Uh, I have, I grew up in this church, and I'm so honored to, to be speaking to you tonight. I have uh, dreamed of this day. Uh, I used to play with my sisters down in the basement, and I'd line them up for church, and I'd preach, and we'd be at New Hope Assembly of God, and I'd be preaching, and, and to have one of my sisters actually here, uh, and I'm preaching for real <laughs> at New Hope. Um, so I'm, I, this is uh, kind of surreal for me, and just so excited uh, to be here, and uh, incredible to see what God is doing uh, in and through New Hope and this wonderful church. Um, like, uh, like Ed said, let's be in prayer for our pastors this, this week, uh, that they'd be re-energized, um, refreshed, and that they would come back with something new and, and fresh for us and a new vision. Uh, just be in prayer for, for our pastors this week. Um, like I said, my name is Jared Atchison. I grew up in this church. Most of you in this room have known me since I was a baby. Um, but for those of you that, that don't, uh, I grew up here, and I, I love this church, and I'm so thankful to have so many, uh, a lot of them in this room of, of grandpas and grandmas and aunts and uncles and, and brothers and sisters that, that aren't blood, but I'm uh, just as grateful for them. Uh, uh, one Sunday in a Midwest city, a young child was acting up during the morning worship hour. The parents did their best to maintain some sense of order in the pew, but were losing the battle. Finally, the father picked the little fellow up and walked sternly up the aisle on his way out. Just before reaching the safety of the foyer, the little one called loudly to the congregation, pray for me, pray for me. I, I think that there's some of you that, that, that knew me when I was that little probably remember, uh, this wasn't me, but I found this, but remember me getting dragged out of service a few times. Um, but I hope that uh, everyone behaves. Bryce, my son, I hope that you don't get drug out tonight. Um, <clears throat> but the message I have tonight uh, is one that I, that I believe that every church in America especially needs to hear. Um, I, I love this church and it's grown tremendously uh, from the very first Sunday. I don't remember it because I was only six months old. But uh, it's been just an incredible joy to, to, as I've grown with this church, I'm, I'm 28, and uh, it's uh, just been an incredible church. But sadly, uh, churches like this one are becoming far and few between. And so the question I have for us tonight is, is there more? Is there more that, that this church could be doing? Have we reached, has New Hope reached its full potential? I, I, don't, I don't think so. Because with God, the, the boundaries are endless. So tonight I, I want to take a look at uh, the New Testament church and what, what was it designed for? And how, how are we, is New Hope a copy of, of what the foundations were laid for us in Acts? God, God has placed new hope in a special place for such a time as this. We have, we have made an impact on this community. This community has been changed. Um, Pastor Weaver just finished a great series on the Holy Spirit, but imagine if, if, our, if our entire church got a hold of that, of the, that four, four or five week series that he just got done with, if we really got hold of living in the power of the Holy Spirit, and that our church would become that even more, the, the possibilities would be endless. Nothing could stop us. So tonight, I want this to be an encouragement, but also a challenge to us to keep doing what we're doing, but, but to better ourselves and to dig deeper. And so that this church uh, is truly an empowered church. So if you have your Bibles, uh, turn to Acts chapter 29. Anybody find it? Oh, that's because it's not there. 
I've just seen how many people I catch. I'd have been one of those people that I'd have got about halfway there and oh, wait a minute. Something's not right here. But that, that's the title of my message tonight is Acts chapter 29. And it's kind of a, a strange title, but I think that at the end of Acts 28, it should say to be continued. We're still living Acts. We are still the New Testament church. It's not over yet. We're still in the church age. And so are we operating as a live and an effective church or are we dead or are we ineffective? So I want to take a look at what, what was set before us as the foundation for Acts and the New Testament church and are we doing that and what, how can we improve? So for real this time, uh, turn to Acts chapter 2 and it's really in there. Verse 42 and 47 we'll be reading from. So as you turn on, let me give you a little bit of a context um, of what's happened. So it's just after the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit has come. Jesus has, Jesus has ascended. He told his disciples to stay in Jerusalem. The Holy Spirit has come. He's baptized those 120 believers uh, in his Holy Spirit. And uh, Peter just got done giving his, I think, the second most famous sermon of all time next to Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. It's pretty hard to preach better than God, but Peter did pretty good once he was full of the Holy Spirit. So he just, he got done preaching that sermon. Uh, thousands of people come to Christ, and God, God is ready to move in an even bigger way and take his church even further. So let's pick up in, uh, in verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods. They gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. I'm going to pray. God, I thank you for your word. I pray that you would speak through me, that I would get out of the way, and that your Holy Spirit would, that I would just be a channel to, uh, to say what, what you have for us tonight. God, that you would open hearts and minds, uh, that we would receive your word, and that you would move in an incredible way tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. So first, let's look at what it means to be truly devoted. So let me give you a little Greek lesson. Uh, the word for devoted is proskartario. And I don't know why, but I'm kind of weird, but I kind of like to say it like Mario does. Proskartario. Everybody say it like that? I don't think that's how, that they, how they said it, but... Pros criteria, and I think I'm saying it right, but it means to exert great effort to persist in doing something or to adhere to. When you exert great energy to something, it's, it's usually not done halfway. You do it to the best of your ability so that no time is waited, wasted. You, you focus on, on the things that are going to make that a lasting effort. They made great effort to make these, we're going to go through four things that they made, they devoted themselves to and made a part of their lives and their ministries. They made these things priorities. So the question I want to ask you tonight is what, what are your priorities? As we go through these things, what, what are your priorities? And is God speaking to you? Let the Holy Spirit speak. And is there some things that, that we need to work on and become better at? Because the first church made these priorities, they saw great fruit from their efforts. Because the church was devoted to God in the mission of the church, three things happened. They were unified, magnified, and multiplied. Unified, magnified, and multiplied. That's going to kind of be a, a common theme for us tonight, those, those three things. And we're going to first look at how are they unified. All of this would not have been possible, all of this would not have been possible without the help of the Holy Spirit. 
And at the end of the service, we're going to take some time, and we're just going to spend time with God, and we're going to ask him to speak to us and ask him, how can I do better? How can we become a better church? So I want to look at, first, they were unified under the word of God. The, the first part of verse 42 says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. They gathered in, I believe it's, uh, well, it says a couple different times that they, it was daily. So they gathered every day to hear the word of God. They were, uh, many of them did not have uh, their own copy of the Bible. And yet they were in it daily. What, what is my excuse when I, I did a quick count and I have a, at least nine Bibles at home? not counting my phone and the internet and the other ways that I can get it and the three or four that, that my kid, each of my kids have, my wife has. Um, and there's nothing wrong with having different versions and a lot of different, different Bibles to help you dig in deeper to the Word, but what good is if we don't use them? If we don't use them, they, they just collect dust. And I, I'm, not, I'm not beating you down on this one. I'm preaching to myself here that I need to be in the Word daily. The Word of God is what equips us and the church to do His work and shows us how to live in a God-honoring manner. 2 Timothy three, sixteen and 17 says this, All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. It gives us the tools in order to do what we've been called to do, what we've been designed to do, what new hope has been called to do, what it has been placed here to do. It is God's divinely inspired word to us. So are, are we truly devoted students of God's word? You may say, well, I, I'm, I'm not a scholar, I'm not a pastor, I'm, I'm not, you know... I don't, I'm not a theologian, so I can't study or understand the Bible. I, I'm so glad that, that our church still offers Sunday school. Sunday school is, is a very important time. And I, there's a lot of churches that are going away from that. But coming from a young man, I still treasure Sunday school. And I learned so much from studying, the God, from studying God's Word with other believers with those that are like-minded, and we can, at the time, uh, when we hear a sermon, there's no interaction. It's, you, you hear a preacher, and, and you respond to the, to the altar, to the Holy Spirit, but Sunday school is a time where you can ask questions. You can interact with the Word and with other people. It's so important. Sunday school is, is so, so important. But as I mentioned earlier, an, another meaning uh, for devoted is to adhere to. They study the Word so much that it stuck and could not be separated from it. Now, I'm sure we've all glued something together. Don't tell me I'm the only one that have super glued my fingers together. Anybody done that? I know a lot of you are lying, because I, I have several times. And one time I almost epoxied them together, and that would have been bad. Um, but when you super glue your fingers together, they adhere. And it's hard to get them back apart. Sometimes skin comes off with it. Um, but as our world is falling apart, it is important now more than ever that we be in God's Word and that we adhere to it. Uh, Charles Spurgeon, I think if you're taking notes, write this down. One of my favorite quotes. Charles Spurgeon, a great preacher of the 1800s, said this. A Bible that is falling apart usually belongs to someone who isn't. A Bible that is falling apart usually belongs to someone who isn't. That's so powerful, so simple, but yet so profound. As our world is, is in disarray and, and things are going crazy, a lot of times the, the people that their life is spiraling out of control, they're the ones that have the Bibles that have dust, dust all over them. And they look like they're brand new and they're 30 years old. Um, but the person that when it seems like their life is going crazy and that you don't know how they do it, most of the time, if you go to that person and you, they show you their Bible, it's going to be marked up. It's going to be ripped up, pages falling apart. It's going to be used. Uh, when the church was united in the Word of God, they had a like mind, 
and together developed the mind and heart of Christ. As a result, their mission became united, and God blessed that mission because it aligned with his word. I pray that I know the word so well that I'm glued to it, to, glued to it forever, and that we become united in it more and more as we study it. It's so important to be in God's word. Second, they were unified in their relationship with each other. They devoted themselves to the fellowship. They were committed to the body of Christ. The Greek word, another, another Greek lesson for fellowship is ko- koionia. In the church, we just kind of throw around the word fellowship. You know, I'm going to go fellowship with, with the believers. It's a kind of a churchy word. Um, and when we use it out, we don't use it out in the secular world because, you know, I'm going to go fellowship with the guys tonight. That, you know, that, that doesn't sound right. They look, people look at you like, what are you talking about? But in the, in the church, we, we kind of throw that word around. But it's much more than just getting together or having a potluck or, or whatever. It, it actually means unity, close association, partnership, participation, a society, a communion, contributory help, or the brotherhood. It's much deeper than a friendship. It's sharing life together. It is having things in common like our faith and our values. And when you have relationships that you invest in and put work into, you begin to have things in common. Uh, Pastor Austin and I uh, have a very close relationship. Uh, We've grown up together. He's a couple years younger than me, so I've known him literally his whole life. Um, But we have a very close relationship. But uh, now he, he loves hunting and fishing. And if you know Pastor Weaver very well, that, that's not something they do. Pastor Weaver with a gun is kind of scary. Uh, <laughs> but not something that Austin loves, but it's because he spent, we spent time together, and now he loves to hunt and fish, and that's something that now we, we enjoy together. A lot of times we'll, we'll get together and we'll just go sit in the blind together and we talk because we don't get to hang out that much anymore. And, uh, it's just an incredible time that we just get to, to be together. And so because we spent time together, we developed more things in common. <clears throat> the church uh, had another very practical way, the, the original New Testament church. They were hospitable and they broke bread together. Uh, the phrase breaking of bread in this passage could have a couple of different implications. Um, First, they could have been sharing the Lord's Supper together. They, should have been, they could have been taking communion as a, a remembrance of the sacrifice that, that God gave. Uh, and it's encouraging and good for us to do that when we see other people, like-minded people, and we're sharing and being thankful for what God has done on the cross and in our lives. That's a good thing to do and that we do that together. But not only that, but... The second implication could also be just an ordinary meal. Uh, think of, it's something, it's something we all have to do. If, if, we don't, if we don't eat, we're gonna die. And I think maybe I need to start working out again because I put on my 30 inch pants and they were a little tighter tonight than I remembered. Some of you are looking at me like, just be quiet. <laughs> but I know it's coming someday, but I'm working on my pulpit bumper. <laughs> but uh, no, but a, a meal is something so simple, but it, it's a necessity, and it's, it's a perfect time in our, in our busy lives to just sit down. We have to slow down. We have to sit down and eat and to just have a conversation with somebody, to ask them how they're doing, how their life's going. Um, just think of, of all the things that have happened in your life over a meal, maybe a a marriage proposal, maybe a breakup, maybe that was good news or bad news, I don't know, um, a job promotion, a job offer, uh, maybe your kid sat you down and told you that you're going to be a grandparent, uh, that happens over a meal, the list could go on and on, a date with your spouse, um, but the first church, they understood the importance of, of sharing meals together, and this is very practical and very simple, but but Luke found it important enough to put this in here because it's important. It, it's, their lives were busy as well, and he knew that if they would set aside time to just share a meal, it, it would grow the church tremendously. 
my parents modeled this for me very well. If we, if we didn't have uh, a good reason or we didn't have permission to, to be at the dinner, to not be at the dinner table, we were in trouble. We were expected to be there. When I was wrestling and cutting weight, I was expected to eat my ice chips with the rest of the family. <laughs> That's cruel. <laughs> but I was expected to be there. And we talked about how our day was and how things were going. And some of my greatest times of laughter, pain, tears, and arguments happened at the dinner table. It's, it's, an, it's an incredible way to just get to know your family and other people. Satan, he wants to, he's trying to distract us and keep us from sharing those times with our family because he knows that if he can destroy the family, he can destroy the individual. If he can do that, he can destroy the church. And that, that's why mealtimes are so, so important. And that's become a rule in our house that our three kids, they're expected to be at the dinner table and it will always be that way. I don't care how, even if it's, sometimes we're busy and it's only a 15 minute meal, but you sit down and we're going to have supper together. It's so important. Hebrews uh, 10, 24 and 25 says this, and let us consider how we may spur on one another in love toward good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. The day there is, is the coming of Christ. We are living in the last days, and it's, more, it's important now more than ever that we need each other. When was the last time that you had an unsafe person over to your house? When was the last time that you had lunch or, or dinner with somebody other than your close seven? A lot of us, if we looked, we have maybe seven or ten clo- what we call close friends. Have you reached outside of that? Let's invite people into our homes. Let's be hospitable because we need each other and they need us and we need them because life is hard. Number three, they were united in prayer. The church understood the importance of prayer. Uh, there's many people in this room that I would call prayer warriors. But why, why can't we all do that? We all have the same access to the same God and he's got the same power and he listens to us just as much as is the person who we would call that prayer warrior. The church realized how important it was for the health of the church. Prayer is our way to communicate with God. In order to be about his business, we must spend time in prayer. We have to get our marching orders from him. But much more than that, we have to, we use it along with the word of God in our own attack on the enemy. Prayer and this, and this word, those are our offensive weapons. The best defense is a good offense. If you keep the ball away from the other offense, they don't get to score. And so we must be in prayer. We must be attacking and be on our knees in prayer for our families, for our pastors, for our churches, for, for our communities and our, our political leaders. We got to be on our knees in prayer and that God would give us something new and new ideas and something fresh for this church to, to take as the world is changing We've got to come up with, the message does not change, but we have to come up with something fresh in order to reach these people. Jesus would, himself would go off many times in a quiet place to pray. If Jesus needed it, I think we need it as well. Number four uh, is one that's not mentioned in this passage, but it's very evident as you go through the book of Acts. We must be empowered by the Holy Spirit. None of this is possible unless we're an empowered church. If the Holy Spirit is not active in our churches, then we will not be effective. Without God's power, the church is just a building that people that call themselves Christians hang out. It's just a club. Without the Holy Spirit, this this is just a building. Acts 4.13 is one of my favorite verses. Peter and John had healed the crippled beggar and they're thrown into prison. And they're speaking to uh, the Sanhedrin. Verse 13 says this, and I would suggest you look this, this verse up. If it's not highlighted in your Bible, do it. This is a powerful verse. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished, and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. These men were nothing special. They had no, they were unschooled. They were uneducated. The world thought of them as, as stupid, 
They didn't have anything to offer. But because they'd been with Jesus, the world saw something different. We're just ordinary people. The church is full of ordinary people, but when they're full of people that have been with Jesus and spent time with, with Jesus and they're empowered by the Holy Spirit, this, this place will be alive. It will be set on fire by the people that are in it that have been with Jesus. Do your coworkers know that you've been with Jesus? Do they notice? Is there something different about you? If not, you need to do a heart check tonight and ask God, set me on fire again. Without the power of the Holy Spirit, we cannot be a powerful and effective church. So we've talked about how the church was unified, and as a result, they were magnified and multiplied. Let's look at some results quickly. I've told you a lot of these things that we can work on and that we need to do, but, but if you don't see results, what's the point? It's like a, you know, those exercise videos. They don't show you the people with the 8-packs and 10-packs for no reason. They want you to buy the product, so here's your results, except this one actually works. They were magnified first by the signs and wonders of the believers. They saw God move in miraculous ways. God is still in the miracle working business. He's still the same God. Last week we were, or two weeks ago now, I had the opportunity to go to camp, and we took 100 high school students to Minnesota, and I saw God do some incredible things. I saw God heal some students physically, emotionally, and spiritually. God is still moving. The same power that parted the Red Sea, healed the blind man, moved at camp, raised Jesus from the dead, is the same God that lives today. And it's the same God that still wants to move in our lives and in, and in this church. We can still see results. Why not here? Why not now? It doesn't have to stop in, in Acts 2. It's in Acts 29 too. They were also magnified through the favor, I almost said flavor, the favor of all the people. They gained favor with the people in the community in which they ministered. Not to say that they didn't have opposition, but they, they had avenues that they could minister because they were doing those four things that we had talked about earlier. God gave them avenues and opportunities to minister in the community. God opens doors to the church that is unified and operating in the Holy Spirit. He wants to use us all, but he's going to use the, the people in the church the most that are, that are in his word, that are unified in each other that are in prayer and that are empowered by his spirit. Those, that's the church and the people that he's gonna use. Worship team, would you come at this time? Lastly, uh, they were multiplied. They began to see a great harvest and people coming to faith in Jesus Christ. It's not about how many people we can get into the church doors but it's, but it's how much Jesus we can get into the people. I want to say that again. It's not about how many people we can get in to the church. It's about how much Jesus we can get into the people. Numbers are not the deciding factor in what makes an effective church. There's churches that are way bigger than this one that have tens of thousands of people that are dead. And there's churches that have 20 people that are alive and vibrant. It's not the number. It's the people inside. Are they empowered by the Holy Spirit? And are they active in moving towards God? The church didn't just operate this way every once in a while. It wasn't just on a Sunday or a Sunday morning, Sunday night, or a Wednesday. They met daily. They cared daily. One souls daily and searched the scriptures daily. And they increased in numbers daily. Their Christian faith was a day-to-day -day reality, not a once-a-week once routine. They made it their life. Is, is, that, is it our life today? Luke knew how important these things were going to be. He, he could have just kept going on with the story, but he, he puts this, these few verses in here because he knew that the church needed to get a hold of these things. 
The book of Acts, I'm going to give you just a quick history. The book of Acts was written in approximately 63 AD. This was only two years before the Emperor Nero would set fire to Jerusalem and blame the Christians so that he could have an excuse to murder them and execute them. In 68 AD, the Apostle Paul was executed, which is an incredible blow to the young church. Paul, he's the reason that, that we have most of the New Testament. And when he was murdered, that, that devastated the church. And in 70 AD, Jerusalem falls. Luke knew that they would need these crucial attributes in order to survive. Today, our world is in chaos. All around the world, Christians are, are under fire and being persecuted. And it's coming here. We're seeing just small glimpses of it, but it's coming. And we got to be ready. We got to be established in these things that, that God has put before us so that we can be a church that stands. We can stand the fire and go through the hard times that are coming. We're in the last days. In church, we gotta be ready. We gotta be full of his spirit. We gotta be full of his word. We gotta go through this thing together. We must have a united church, a magnified church, so that we can be multiplied. There's so many people in this community that need to be reached. So many people. There's no reason that, that these pews should not be full. People are hungry. They're dying. And do we see that? Whose responsibility is it? Is it the pastors? Is it the deacons? The elders? The Sunday school teachers? The congregation? Who, whose responsibility is it? I want to leave you with this story. And I'm almost done. A, small, a, a new pastor in a small Oklahoma town spent the first four days making personal visits to each of the members, inviting them to come to his first services. The following Sunday, the church was all but empty. Accordingly, the pastor placed a notice in the local newspapers, stating that because the church was dead, it was everyone's duty to give it a decent, a decent Christian burial. The funeral would be held the following Sunday afternoon, the notice said. Morbidly curious, a large crowd turned out for the funeral. In front of the pulpit, they saw a closed coffin, smothered in flowers. After the pastor delivered the eulogy, he opened the coffin and invited his congregation to come forward and pay their final respects to their dead church. Filled with curiosity, as to what would represent the corpse of a dead church, all the people eagerly lined up to look in the coffin. Each mourner peeped into the coffin, then quickly turned away with a guilty, sheepish look. In the coffin, tilted at the correct angle, was a large mirror. It's up to you and I, all of us in this room and in our whole church, to make this church the way the New Testament church was intended. If you want a church that's dedicated to the Word of God, then be dedicated to the Word. If you want a church that's united in our relationships, have people over, be united, be reaching out to new people. Do that. If you want a church that, that is spending time with God, then do it yourself. If you want a church that's empowered by His Spirit, then be seeking His Holy Spirit every day. We're all in this boat together, and it comes down to our relationship with God and what with others looks like. It first starts vertical, and then it goes horizontal. What's our vertical relationship like first? And then we will be able to go horizontal.